All right, folks, so we're doing something a little different today. Um, so <clears throat> we're not doing it synchronously, but uh, let's pretend as if we were. So um, in person, we can do think pair share. It's harder virtually, um, but I'm gonna give everybody a couple minutes to um, test out this problem, just to make sure that you got all of the lessons from last week about five number summary, how do we calculate IQR, how do we draw a box plot? So just sketch this by hand. You don't need to pull up SPSS. Um, just to make sure that you know um, how to do these things. So I'll, I'll leave it two minutes, uh, try to actually do it at home, and I'll work through it together with you guys. So two minutes starting now. All right, <clears throat> hope you gave it a shot. <laughs> so let's talk through this now. So five number summary. So what I usually do is start by, um, okay, well, first of all, min and max are easy. So this is already sorted for you. So the min is one, max is 11. Then I usually start by finding the median. So one, two, three, four, five. So we can almost eyeball it here with the data set of this size. If we pick six, we have one, two, three, four, five below six, that's five data points. And then we have seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 above six, that's five data points. So median perfectly split, splits the sample into two equally sized data sets. That's how we know it's the median. So our median is six. Then for first quartile, we wanna find the median of the data below the median. So again, we can easily just eyeball it here. That's gonna be three, because one, two, that's two data points below that quartile, and four, five, two data points above that quartile. All right, and same here. We got nine as the third quartile, because that evenly splits the data above the median. Calculate the IQR. To do that, we wanna subtract the third quartile from the first quartile. So in that case, it's nine minus three. That is six, our IQR is six. And then draw a box plot. Uh, <coughs> Let's save that for the end. First, let's do how large or small would a number have to be to be an outlier. So determine the outlier. It is gonna be 1.5 times the IQR, that much above the third quartile or that much below the first quartile. So this is gonna be 1.5 times six, which is nine. So we would have to be, the third quartile is nine. So we would have to be above 18 or uh, sorry, the, the first quartile is three, so three minus nine, that'd be below negative six. So to draw a box plot, we just have this one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, our median is six. 
<laughs> oh, excuse me. Our third quart quartile is nine. First quartile is three. That's my box. That's the middle 50% of the data. And then it extends down to one and up to 11 as the max. So that should be your plot spot like that. So that was just a quick check uh, to see if you remember a five number summary, what, how to draw a box plot um, and outliers. So if any of that was rusty, take a look back at the lecture from last week. Okay. I want to um, show another example. This is, uh, I think your textbook uses this framework. Uh, when you're thinking about a statistical problem, uh, especially because we're doing applied statistics, right? How do statistics apply to the problems we encounter in nursing? Uh, you want to state what the practical question is in the context of the real world setting. So um, don't have a like a stats based question like what what is the significant difference between well, like no we want to say you know are these two groups of patients different? Um, not what's the chi squared value of something 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 okay. Um, so are these two groups of patients different, for instance? Um, plan. What specific statistical operations does this question call for? Solve it and then make conclusions in the wording of how it applies to your patient care in the real world setting. So I'll give you an example that we because that's what we've been working on lately. Um, time required for patient care. So I got this example out of a book written by a nurse manager uh, talking about how she uses stats in her nurse management practice. So she needs to know how long does a nurse need to spend with each patient in the hospital ward, right? Because that's a staffing issue. So as nurse manager, that's her responsibility is to figure out, um, you know, how many nurses do I need to have on duty for each shift based on how full is my, um, how full is the ward right now? And What's the patient mix here? Are there people who need a lot of help, people who don't need much help? Um, so first, uh, make a histogram to look at how much time each patient seems to be requiring. So here's an example of comparing histograms in three different groups of patients. So she split patients into three different groups. We have the self-care group, these are the most mobile, the patients who are doing the best, uh, can do some things for themselves. And we have intermediate care and intensive care patients. And she looked, she tracked and measured how long do patients uh, in each of these groups require from their nurses. Remember, these are the smoothed out histograms, but underlying the height of each of these curves are individuals in the data set. So these are made up of data points based on actual patients in these groups, how long did it take to care for them? So for instance, you can see in group three, the mean median mode here is about 55 to 16 minutes, right? So that's saying there's a lot of individual patients in this ward who took 55 to 60 minutes of nursing care during a six hour period, right? Fewer, relatively fewer patients were down in this bin over here where they took 85, 90 minutes, right? Fewer patients were down here in this bin where they took 25, 30 minutes. So underlying, we see these smooth curves, but in your head, remember thinking out what does a histogram mean? Those curves are made up of lots of bins that you're just not seeing. And each of those bins is made up of individual patients in your data set. So we can see that on average, uh, patients in group three intensive care took maybe 55, 60 minutes on average, and that's mean, median, or mode. So no matter which um, measure of center you use, uh, patients in group two took maybe 20, 25 minutes to care for. And patients in group one took maybe 10, 12 minutes to care for. So we can see that these histograms tell a really great story about uh, the kind of staffing and care that would be required for each patient group. So you can see not only is the center or the median or mean time required in group three higher than in the other two groups, the spread is also a lot higher, right? This, um, this histogram is really like flattened out and really wide 
versus, for instance, care group one, the range in that histogram is quite small, right? Like everything is very clustered uh, around the mean here. So a typical patient maybe takes 10 or 12 minutes, but almost everybody in this data set for group one is taking between maybe two and 18 minutes, right? That's not a very broad range. Basically no patients in care group one took more than 22 minutes to care for. You can see here is the max. Versus in care group three, the spread is really wide. So you can see patients could take anywhere from, you know, 10 minutes to take care of to 100 minutes to take care of. That's 90 minutes. So um, if you're staffing this ward and you have a lot of care group three patients, you're going to be a lot more uncertain about how much staffing do I need to handle these patients because the spread can be so variable um, for these patients versus if you have a lot of care group one, you can make a pretty precise estimate about like, okay, if I have 10 patients, it's going to take about 100, 100 minutes of care uh, because each patient is going to take about 10 minutes to care for, right? Um, so when you look at these histograms, that really helps tell that story. And so basically she did this work and she found, you know, this is about 10, about 20, uh, about roughly 50. So for shorthand, she was like, it's a ratio of one to two to five on average. So if you know how many patients you have in group one, how many patients you have in group two, and how many patients you have in group three, you can kind of calculate out about on average, um, how much nursing care are you gonna need to provide uh, during a six hour period. Yep. So I hope this is a, a good example of how uh, nurses uh, maybe you want to visualize their data and use histograms in real life to manage uh, their staffing and plan out care for patients in their ward. All right. So I'm just going to move through that. So um, let's talk about the new material for this week. Scatter plots and correlation. So we're going to be talking about bivariate data, which means when we look at how two variables are related to each other, bivariate two variables. We're going to talk about creating and interpreting scatter plots, and then calculating and interpreting a correlation coefficient, which we abbreviate as R. So in the first class, we talked about categorical and quantitative data. So far, we've mostly been looking at graphs or statistics about one variable at a time, or maybe looking at one variable in two or more groups, right? So like our histograms, we had um, one variable that we're looking at the distribution of. Uh, box plots, we had one variable we're looking at, although sometimes we make side-by-side -side box plots where we look at this one variable in two different groups, right? One box plot for each group. When we're talking about correlation, we're looking at two variables and how they change together. And scatter plots almost always use two quantitative variables. So we can't use, um, we can't easily use categorical or binary variables. We're generally using quantitative variables. So those are like the continuous uh, or discrete variables we talked about. So those would be things like blood pressure, HIV viral load, uh, cholesterol, things that take on a numerical value that vary over a range. So we want two variables like that when we are doing correlation. So here's just a toy example from your textbook. So they looked at the number of beers that someone drank and blood alcohol content. So here uh, you can drink 2.2 beers, but um, I guess they measured it as whole numbers. So this would be a discrete uh, variable. And then blood alcohol content, uh, that would be a continuous variable. This is just uh, the ID number. So that's just giving a unique identifier for each individual in your data set. So here we're saying student one drank five beers and then their blood alcohol content was measured as 0.1. Student two drank two beers and their blood alcohol content was 0.03. So in this example, we wanna understand as the number of beers you drink increases, how does that affect your blood alcohol content? So um, I'm sure you all know, the more beers you drink in general, the higher your blood alcohol content is, right? So, but we wanna plot this statistically. So to do this, we can use a scatter plot. So what we do is we take 
one variable and we put on the x-axis, in this case, number of beers. And the other quantitative variable we put on the y-axis, in this case, BAC or blood alcohol content. Then each point we do corresponds to one individual in the data set. So in this case, student number seven drank three beers and had a blood alcohol content of 0.07. So we find three beers. and blood alcohol content of 0.07. And we plot that point on the graph that corresponds at the height and the position of three beers on the x-axis and 0.07 on the y-axis, right? And we complete that. So there's as many dots on the scatter plot as there are individuals in this data set, right? So again, we have, let's do another one. This student one had five beers and a blood alcohol content of 0.1. So we'd look at five beers and 0.1. So that would end up being this person here. Okay. So you wanna be careful when you're doing scatter plots not to use the wrong variable. So sometimes people will accidentally use the value here of the student ID number. So the ID number is irrelevant to the discussion, right? Cause we're just talking about number of beers and your blood alcohol content. So you don't want to accidentally plot like one against 0.1. So some people might mistakenly think that this data point down in the corner represents that first person. That's not correct because we want to ignore the ID number. We're just looking at the number of beers and the blood alcohol content. So it's five and 0.1. Sorry, this is uh, 0.01 here anyway, not 0.1. Here's another example. Two other things that tend to correlate with one another are height and weight. Uh, as you get taller, taller people tend to weigh more than shorter people, right? So um, you can see as height increases, in general, we see a trend where weight is also increasing, right? So we can sort of draw a line among all these dots and see there's a pattern that as one is going up, the other one is also going up. So. Uh, what do we mean by relationships? So statistical relationships are overall tendencies, not ironclad rules. So there are people who are taller, but way less than a shorter person does, right? So even though in general, um, as height increases, so does weight. Um, you know, there could be someone who's taller than me who weighs less than me. That's totally possible. It's not an ironclad rule. The relationship just describes what's happening on average and allows for those individual exceptions. Statistics is all about variation. So we wanna describe the variation and try to explain it. Um, that's what we're talking about with correlation. So in on average, as X increases, Y increases, or on average, as X increases, maybe Y decreases. Uh, in correlation, we're talking about association and not causation. So you're gonna hear me say many times in this class, correlation is not causation. So we notice that changes in one variable tend to be associated with changes in another variable, but it doesn't mean that one variable is necessarily causing the other variable. And we'll talk more about this in this class. Um, so in the case of beers and blood alcohol content, I think we can say confidently that uh, blood alcohol content is being uh, caused by the number of beers you drink. Um, but not every time we do a correlation, it's not always causally related. Sometimes it's just by happenstance uh, or for other reasons that we see two variables having a strong correlation with each other. So relationship basically at the end of the day in plain language asks, how does variable Y change on average as variable X changes? So here's an example. We might be interested in looking at the state level. Um, how does the number of cigarettes purchased per state resident vary with the number of lung cancer deaths we observe in that state? So here, I'm guessing we have 50 dots, one for each data, one for each state. Because if we're looking at the state level, then in this data set, states would be the individuals in our data set, and we have 50 states. And you can kind of see this pattern in this cloud. If you were to draw a line that sort of describes the trajectory of the points, 
as the number of cigarettes purchased per state resident increases, we also see that in general or on average, uh, the number of lung cancer deaths we observe in that state also goes up. So it's not an ironclad rule, right? Here we have a state where there are 28 cigarettes purchased per state resident. And there are about 16 deaths per 100,000 in that state. And in this state, there are fewer cigarettes purchased per person, but more lung cancer deaths, right? So it's on average, as the number of cigarettes purchased increases, the number of lung cancer death increases, but it's not always, right? And there can be, that's because lung cancer is driven by many things, right? So maybe that's a state that has a lot of mining and people are getting lung cancer from uh, inhaling uh, carcinogens from being in the mine or um, a state that has a lot of asbestos or radon uh, or um, yeah, different environmental factors that can cause lung cancer also. So it's not just about cigarettes, right? Um, so we see a general pattern or correlation between these two variables, but it's not an ironclad rule. But you can see how, um, again, I could give you a table that has 50 data points in it uh, for one for each state. Uh, you would struggle to make sense of all those numbers, but we just make one picture, which is like three clicks in SPSS, where we plot number of deaths against number of cigarettes. And this gives you a clear initial picture of how are these two variables related? And we see, yes, there seems to be a correlation uh, between these two variables. Okay, so how do you pick which variable, which variable goes on the x-axis and which variable goes on the y-axis? <sighs> so we call the variable on the x-axis the explanatory variable. So that means it explains uh, the other variable, which we call the response variable. Uh, the response variable is measuring some kind of outcome. So um, in other stats courses or math courses, you may have heard the explanatory variable called the independent variable. And the variable on the y-axis is called the dependent variable because you see the outcome depends on the other variable. So uh, the textbook that we use for this class uses explanatory and response variable, but just to map that onto terms you may be more familiar with. Um, I like explanatory and response variable. I think it's clear. So response or dependent variable me measures the outcome and the explanatory va uh, variable somehow explains or influences changes in the response variable. So sometimes it's hard to tell which of the two variables sh should go on the X axis and which should go on the Y axis. But in a lot of cases, it's pretty clear, right? The number of beers you drink is gonna be the explanatory variable and the response uh, to that uh, imbibing of alcohol is gonna be your blood alcohol content. So drinking beer is what drives blood alcohol content, not the other way around, right? Um, so we would put explanatory number of beers on the x-axis and then the response uh, blood alcohol content on the y-axis. Again, in cases where it's less clear, you might uh, kind of leave it up to you which one you put on x and y, uh, but where it is clear, you want to put explanatory on x and response on y. So correlation is not causation, coming back to this. So um, there's generally sort of two reasons uh, why we might see a strong relationship or correlation between two variables, but uh, there's not any causal relationship, we say. There's no clear link. Uh, so unlike drinking beers causing your blood alcohol content to go up, that's a clear direct link. Uh, sometimes we see things that are correlated without any explanation. Uh, we're going to talk about this more later in the class, but sometimes two variables are both strongly influenced by other variables that are lurking in the background. These are also called confounders, or it might just happen by chance. So when you have two examples of what those look like, it'll make more sense in a couple slides. So here's an example of just two things being correlated by chance. And we gave this uh, as a silly example um, 
in a previous lecture and you can actually go to this website and it's kind of fun. Uh, you can make spurious correlations uh, between lots of different silly variables uh, and see like as the number of Tom Hanks movies that year increases, like so too does like the number of divorces or the number of drownings or, you know, just random stuff that has nothing to do with each other, but they just by chance happen to follow a similar pattern. So you can see uh, over time, uh, margarine consumed <laughs> uh, decreased as did the divorce rate in Maine. Uh, so uh, whether or not you like eating, if we interpreted this in a causal way, we would say, wow, the more margarine you eat, the more likely you are to get divorced. Uh, I should avoid eating margarine to keep my relationship safe, right? Uh, but there's clearly no causal relationship between uh, the amount of margarine you eat and whether uh, how secure you are in your marriage. Um, what's more likely, likely happening here is that over time, there's just sort of general trends uh, where people are now kind of moving away from margarine, rediscovering butter. <laughs> Uh, and over time uh, in this decade, uh, there was also just a little bit um, divorce slowed down just by chance. So we see this correlation, uh, even though there's not any causal reason why how much margarine you eat should really be related to how likely you are to get divorced. And here's a more serious example. So as you may know, um, polio virus was a serious epidemic in the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, kids especially would get paralyzed and have to be put on iron lungs. And there was just a lot of um, terror around that, right? Um, and so here is an analysis someone did where they looked at ice cream sales and number of polio cases. And they found that they tracked it over the course of the year, right? They had one data point for each month. And they were like, wow, the number of ice cream sales tracks perfectly with um, the number of polio cases. So if you plot it over time, you can see how these two lines like perfectly track each other. Uh, if you don't plot it over time and you just plot, this is like the scatter plot version here on the right. So if you plot, Ice cream sales, we're thinking ice cream maybe explains how many polio virus cases we have, right? We don't think that polio makes you want to eat ice cream. That would be if we thought polio was the explanatory variable. We think maybe polio is being spread through ice cream. Maybe it's a foodborne illness that um, people are getting. Uh, so people put ice cream sales on the X, they put polio cases on the Y as the response variable. And there is a perfect, look at that, beautiful, perfect straight line correlation. As you increase the amount of ice cream, polio goes straight up. And people actually like, this was a pro in the 40s and 50s for a while, people thought that ice cream was causing polio. Like they thought there was a foodborne, uh, a virus was foodborne. And so like, um, see they had articles like this in uh, legitimate scientific journals, trying to look at like the survival of uh, the, Outbreak was in Lansing, Michigan, actually. So survival of Lansing strain of the poliomyelitis virus in ice cream, looking at, okay, like how long is polio survivors can it survive in ice cream? Um, you know, ice cream companies like took a big hit because no one was like buying ice cream anymore because they thought that polio was um, caused by ice cream because of this incredibly strong correlation between ice cream sales and polio outbreaks. Um, but as it turned out, this was just a correlation and maybe um, maybe you know why. So a lot of polio is um, waterborne and people were getting it like at swimming pools and stuff like that. So um, they were going to swimming pools in the summer when the weather was nice. And that's also the same time that people like to eat ice cream. So um, this was a spurious correlation, right? It wasn't spreading through ice cream, but it was spreading through other activities that people tend to do around the same time that they eat ice cream. So ice cream looked very correlated, even though it turns out it wasn't causally associated. So there was a lot of time spent barking up the wrong tree, looking at ice cream as a big culprit of spreading polio, uh, when in fact it was more things like swimming pools um, and other things that happen in the summer and the warmer times. Um, 
that we're spreading polio. So um, sometimes even if there's this really strong correlation that seems very compelling, uh, you know, we should all avoid ice cream. Um, it's not always causally related, no matter how strong the correlation is that you see. So that is a word of warning when you're looking at two variables and you see a very strong correlation, still wanna be careful about trying to make an argument that is causally related. Okay, so once we make the scatter plot, we look at a couple different directions, strengths, and outliers. So I'm gonna go over each of those things with you. So first is form. So one type of form is called linear. And that's what we see a straight line. So here we can easily draw a straight line through the data that kind of describes the average trajectory of the points in this bivariate scatter plot. Nonlinear relationship is when there seems to be some kind of relationship between the two variables, but it's not a straight line. So in this case, there's clearly something going on. There's like a U-shaped relationship where as X increases, first Y increases, but as X gets really high, Y then starts going down again, right? So that is definitely a clear, strong relationship between X and Y, but it's not linear because it's not a straight line. There's a bend to this curve, right? Similarly for the second one, as X increases, Y is also increasing, but it's not increasing in a straight line. This is more of an exponential function, right? This is a curved, there's a bend in this line. Same thing here, clear, strong relationship, but this is not a straight line, right? It's a, like a sinusoidal shape. So when we talk about form, we can have, either have a linear or a nonlinear relationship. And that refers to this overall pattern of the relationship between the two variables. Okay, so that's form, linear, nonlinear. Then we have direction. So if we call what we call a positive direction means high values of one variable tend to occur with high values of the other variable. So as the explanatory variable increases, we see higher an increase in the response variable as well. So as X increases, Y also increases. So we see here, this has a high X value and a high Y value, or down here, low X value and low Y value. So that's called a positive correlation, when as one increases, the other increases as well. Negative is the opposite. So that's when high values of one are associated with low values of the other variable. So as X increases, Y actually tends to go down in response. So when we draw the line, it's slanting now down toward the right-hand corner, right? When we had a positive association, it was slanting up toward the right -hand, top right-hand corner. When we have a negative association, it's slanting downward toward the bottom right-hand corner. So we call that a negative association. Okay, so we did form and direction. Now we're talking about strength. So strength of the relationship between two variables refers to how much variation there is around this main form. So both of these are sort of, seem like plausibly linear relationships, right? And both plausibly negative linear relationships. We can draw a straight line that's pointing toward the bottom right-hand corner, right? So a straight line, that's the form is linear, pointing downward toward the bottom right-hand corner, that's uh, the direction is negative. Um, but these are two very different scatter plots, right? In this scatter plot, the points are all clustered very close to the line. There's not a lot of variation. You don't see a lot of points out here that are far away from this relationship. Everything is clustered really closely around that line. In the second scatter plot, you can see there's, you can draw this line that sort of describes, in general, we see as serotonin increases, your personality score also decreases, um, but there's a lot more variation, right? Uh, these points are a lot farther 
in many cases from the line. So you have some points that are close by to the line, but a lot of points are, you know, pretty far away. There's more scatter, more variation. So we call this a weaker relationship. It's strong if it is close to, if all the points are really close to the line. It's weaker if there are a lot of points that are farther away from the line. A weaker relationship, the points are gonna look more diffuse, more scattered, more like a cloud. Uh, the stronger the relationship, the more closely they just line up perfectly on a line. Then you have cases where the strength of the relationship is so weak that you can't even necessarily make a line at all or tell what's happening here. Here, when you see something that just looks like stars in the night sky, <laughs> you just have a lot of points everywhere. It's sort of just a cloud of points. It's not really clear what's going on, right? Like I could draw a line here, but I could also sort of like see like connecting a line like this or maybe just sort of describing a line like this. Like there's, it's too, so diffuse, so scattered that uh, it's really not possible um, to easily tell like any kind of strong relationship between the two variables. So whenever you see stuff that looks like this on your scatter plot, it's just like a cloud of points tend to have weak or no relationship between the variables. Okay. So here's a check-in. We have a scatter plot. We drew a line of best fit through the uh, points. What would be the form, direction, and strength? So I'll give you a couple seconds to think that through, and then I'll answer the question. Okay. So form, we have linear or nonlinear, right? So here we see a pretty clear straight line pattern. It's not no curvy lines, no bent lines. Nothing fancy going on, just a straight line. So you say that's that's linear. Direction, we have positive or negative. Once we've established it's linear, we either have a positive or a negative relation direction. Here, we would say it's negative, right? Because it's pointing toward the bottom right-hand corner. As this x variable increases in general, the y variable is decreasing. So we say that's negative. And the strength. We'll talk in a second about how to quantify strength, um, but in general, fairly strong, right? Uh, I'd say most of the points are fairly close to this line. So we'll say moderately strong. Okay. So if you got only some of those right, definitely go back and review uh, what we talked about to make sure you got all the definitions straight in your head. Okay, here's another example. So I'll give you 30 seconds again to think this one through. All right. So form, we got linear or nonlinear. This relationship is starting to get a little weaker, but I'd say you can still argue for a pretty good um, linear relationship, right? We have this line that we're able to draw through the data and it reasonably well describes what's going on here. So we'll say linear. Direction, that line is pointing toward the upper right-hand corner. As X increases, Y is generally increasing as well. So we call that A positive direction and strength. If you compare them, this one is a lot stronger, right? Uh, the points are clustered more closely to the line. Here, it's starting to look a little bit more like a cloud, a little more diffuse, a little more scattered. So, you know, I would say moderate here at best, maybe moderate to weak. But moderate, I think is fair. Okay, so here, give you another couple of seconds to think about this one. 
So this one, I would say, um, here's where you get an example of those cloud, like stars in the night sky scatter plots. When you have a situation like this, there's no clear way, like the line, the best fit could be here, it could be here, it could be here. Um, yeah, it could be some nonlinear relationship. Um, it's really just hard to tell what kind of relationship these two variables have because it's so weak. Um, so that means X is just really not correlated with Y in this case. So um, I would say we can't really tell what form it is. Uh, there's no clear direction and um, strength, we would say no relationship. Okay, so here's where we uh, move beyond um, kind of eyeballing it and actually quantifying with some, some hardcore stats. So we can calculate what's called the correlation coefficient. We usually abbreviate that to be R. I don't actually know why we picked R, but that's what we picked uh, as statisticians. <laughs> uh, correlation coefficient we say is R. Um, and it measures the direction and strength of a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. So you have to decide that the relationship is linear before you try to calculate the correlation coefficient. So if you have a scatter plot and the points are scattered like this, there's clearly a relationship between your variables, but it's not a straight line. It's not linear. So do not try to calculate a correlation coefficient. SPSS will give you a correlation coefficient if you tell it to calculate one for this, but it doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless because correlation coefficient was only intended to be calculated for data sets where the two variables have a linear relationship. So you have to look at the picture first and decide using your eyeballs that the relationship is plausibly a straight line between the two variables. Okay, so once you've decided that it is a straight line, there is a linear relationship, when you calculate the cor <laughs> correlation coefficient, the value of that correlation indicates whether the direct, what the direction of the relationship is. So a positive direction will have a positive correlation coefficient and a negative direction will have a negative correlation coefficient. Matches up, easy to remember. And then the strength of the relationship is measured by, which we talked about, the strength is how tightly clustered is it on the line. The correlation coefficient, how large it is, will quantify for you uh, what the strength is. So that way you can compare two different scatter plots. If you calculate the correlation coefficient, you can then quantify which one has a stronger relationship. The correlation coefficient, again, does not tell you if the relationship is linear. You have to decide that with your eyeballs. And it also doesn't provide information on the slope of the line by itself. You have to calculate that separately. So uh, we'll, we'll give some examples of what that looks like. The correlation coefficient R is always a number between negative one and one. Anything at zero or close to zero of a correlation coefficient, Zero means there is no relationship. So if we tried to calculate a correlation coefficient for this mess here, we should get a core, uh, R of about zero because there's really no relationship. So if your correlation coefficient is 0.01, it's close to zero. If it's negative 0.01 is close to zero. So there's some very, very weak relationship, but it's practically zero. As you get farther away from zero, whether closer to positive one or closer to negative one, you're indicating a stronger relationship. So if you have a correlation coefficient of one, it's basically gonna look like this. Everything is really clustered along a line and there's a positive correlation. If you have a correlation coefficient of negative one, it's basically gonna, gonna look like this. 
all your data points are clustered along a line and it's going in the negative direction. So negative one and positive one both indicate a strong relationship. It's just one is in the positive direction and one is in the negative direction. So sometimes people mess up and they think negative one means there's no relationship. And then the larger it gets, that's the stronger. But zero is the weakest possible, no relationship. And then as you go away from zero, whether that's toward positive one or negative one, that's indicating a stronger relationship. So a correlation coefficient of negative 0.8 indicates a stronger relationship than or correlation coefficient of 0.3 because negative 0.8 is getting down here, right? Close to negative one, whereas 0.3 is a lot closer to zero than it is to one. So point, negative 0.8 is actually the stronger relationship compared to a correlation coefficient of 0.3. So to understand strength, we ignore the positive and minus. The positive and minus just tell us about the direction of the relationship. So here's some examples. The top two, both positive correlation. You can see the, co the correlation coefficient is above zero, between zero and one. 0. 0.5 is not as strong of a relationship as one is. So you can see the points here are more scattered, more diffuse versus the points here are clustering really tightly, actually perfectly, that's what 1.0 means, along a straight line. Examples of what negative correlation coefficients look like. So we have negative 0.66. So you can see there's probably some kind of line of best fit that goes like this. It's going in the negative direction. There's more scatter here than there is in this right hand graph where everything is perfectly clustered along the line. You can see this R of negative 0.66 is clustered more closely than this graph with the R of 0.5, right? Point six, negative 0.66 is farther away from zero than is 0.5. So that means that this graph here with negative, excuse me, 0.66, um, there's a stronger relationship between those two variables than there is in this graph with R of 0.5. So don't get confused because R of 0.5 is positive, R of negative 0.66 is negative, and think R of 0.5 is the stronger relationship. We have to ignore the positive and negative if we're just looking at strength. Positive and negative tell us about direction. So this one is pointing upward, this one is pointing downward. That's what the negative and the positive tell us. Okay. I just like to show a lot of examples of scatter plots so you get a sense for what a correlation coefficient of a certain value means. So R of zero, night sky, constellation, just a mess. Right, hot mess of points, no clear line that you can draw through this. R of negative 0.3. We're starting to see a little bit of coalescing around uh, here. We could draw a line. So there's still a ton of scatter around this line. Points are still pretty diffuse, but there's a clear direction that in general, there's a slight de decrease in Y uh, as X increases. And as you keep going, R 0.5, negative 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, negative 0.99. You can see the strength of the relationship continues to increase regardless of the direction. So as we get closer to an absolute value of one, farther away from zero, uh, you can see the diffuseness, that cloudiness, gets more and more condensed onto a line. So 0 0.9 is looking a lot tighter along this line than is 0.5, right? Negative 0.7 is looking tighter along the line than was 0.5. So different direction, but slightly stronger. Then we get really close to one, negative 0.99. We see a really strong relationship that happens to be negative. Okay, so here's another example. You look at this top part, Let's look at it row by row. So this first row, Correlation coefficient of 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0, negative 0.4, negative 0.8. So you can see 0 is the hot mess of stars. Negative 0.4 here and 0.4, same strength, 
just different direction. This one, you would draw a line going this way. This one, you would draw a line going this way. Same strength, just different direction. Same for negative 0.8 and 0.8. Okay. For row two, the point we're making here is that correlation coefficient doesn't tell you anything about the slope of the line. It tells you about the strength and the direction. So all of these have a correlation coefficient of one. So they're all really strongly correlated. They're clustered along a straight line. Um, and they're all in a positive direction, but they have different slopes, right? So these are different data sets, different relationship between the two variables, but they have the same correlation coefficient. So just important to know what correlation coefficient does not tell you. It is not about the slope of the line. It's about the strength and the direction. Similarly, these all have a correlation coefficient of negative one. Different slopes, but same strength, same direction. And then the last row here is just hammering home. These, <laughs> there's obviously a clear pattern in these scatter plots, right? X has some kind of relationship with Y, but it's not a linear relationship. You cannot draw a straight line describing any of these. So if you make SPSS give you a correlation coefficient for all of these scatter plots on the bottom row, it would tell you the correlation is zero. There's clearly a relationship between those variables, but it cannot be measured with the correlation coefficient because the correlation coefficient only measures the strength and direction of linear relationships. So you need to decide by looking at the picture that the relationship is linear before you ask SPSS to give you a correlation coefficient. Okay, more examples, just getting used to seeing different types of scatter plots and what the correlation coefficient is. So just including this for your benefit. Okay, so uh, usually I would do a poll for this, but I'm gonna give a couple minutes. So this is a little test of uh, the material. So uh, pick for yourself, does graph A have a correlation coefficient of negative one, negative 0.7, zero, 0 0.7 or one, and then match those correlation coefficients to each of the graphs. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and then I'll reveal the answers. Let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, so let's start with the easiest one. Uh, so what is the constellations of stars in the sky hot mess of points one? I'm gonna go with E. This has a correlation coefficient of zero. There's no relationship between these two variables. You can't draw any sort of sensible line in there. Okay. Next easiest is looking at the ones that have a perfect relationship. This one here, you can draw a perfect line it's pointed downward. So that's going to have a correlation coefficient of negative one. C, perfect line pointed upward, coefficient of one. B, different slope, still a perfect line, still pointing upward, correlation coefficient of one. Okay, so now we just have A and F to do. A and F, you can see there does seem to be some kind of linear relationship. I would draw a line something like this. Uh, it's not a perfect correlation though, so but it is pointing in this direction. 
So I'm going to say it needs to be positive and it needs to be somewhere between zero and one. So out of my choices here, we're going to say 0.7. And similarly here, same but negative direction, right? So negative 0 0.7. So hopefully that was a good quiz. Uh, if you didn't get some of them right, go back and listen uh, and make sure you nail down those concepts. Okay, so to sum up, correlation is about linear association and you have to use your eyeballs to look at the picture, make the picture, make the scatter plot and decide if it's linear or you start ordering SPSS to give you correlation coefficients. Check the data with the scatter plot. Um, the correlation coefficient tells you about positive and negative linear associations. It cannot tell you anything about curved or other nonlinear relationships, no matter how strong those relationships are. R has no unit of measure. It's just a number that's unitless. Uh, it's based on standardized values of observations. So no matter um, what units your X variable is in or your Y variable is in, R just uh, is a number between negative one and one and doesn't have a unit associated with it. Uh, correlation is always between negative one and one. Closer to zero is weaker. Zero means no relation, no linear relationship. Negative one or one is strong, strong relationship. So closer, further away you get from zero, closer to get to either negative one or one is a stronger relationship. You need both variables to be quantitative. Don't try to order correlation coefficient between uh, race and blood pressure because race is not quantitative, right? That's a categorical variable. You have to have an explanatory variable and a response variable that are both quantitative, so discrete or continuous. Uh, like mean and standard deviation, R is not resistant. So actually, if you have some outliers in your data set, uh, it's going to skew. Um, it's going to really strongly affect the R that you're able to calculate. So you want to think carefully when you look at your scatter plot. There's some outliers. Uh, you want to investigate those first and make sure they're not typos or something, and you want to keep them in your data set uh, before running a correlation coefficient. Scatter plots and correlations work together to give a more complete picture. So don't blindly, again, don't blindly run a correlation coefficient on your data. Make sure to make the picture first, look at the picture, interpret it in context with the correlation coefficient. Okay, so we're gonna stop there and then we're gonna get on um, Zoom uh, to do live uh, demo of how do we calculate correlations in SPSS. You'll see at the end of this slide deck, uh, there are a couple of slides. I said bonus slides for the mathematically curious if you wanna know the formula for calculating correlation coefficient, but uh, for the purposes of this class, you will not be tested on that. All right, so I'll see you in a minute. Let's join on Zoom.